welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. Oh wow, I'm really excited about this. Melena Cromie's joining us today from Boomerang. And we are gonna do a research release with you all about generational giving. Wow. Welcome. Welcome everyone. And thank you, Julia, for that intro. I'm super excited and happy to be here today. Well, thank you. You know, I am a geek for anything this research related. Your team sent me this report. It blew my mind. It got me all excited. It's very, very substantial. Um, don't miss page 40 because it has this really cool graphic of the donor timeline journey, which I've never seen anybody quite do it that way. Um, so I just got a witness on that, but it's really cool. And it's wonderful to have you here so that we can really dig into this. Another thing that we want to dig into are our amazing partners and they include Bloomerang where uh, we get so much support from them. American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episode on Fridays, and Your Part-Time Controller. We also have an amazing cohort of co-hosts. They come to us from all over the country. They do very diverse work. They work um, from different regions and different sectors, and they are amazing. So I hope you've been able to meet them as well. Okay. Malena Cromie, Senior Manager, PR and Communications, Bloomerang. That's a big title, my friend. <laughs> it, it is rather long. <laughs> we can abbreviate it a little bit. You know, it's good. Um, well, it's a cool thing. I wanted, I mentioned this to you in the green room, and I wanted to kind of start um, with my own, if you will, per personal witness is that. Yeah. Um, your organization does a tremendous amount of research and the amazing thing about this research is that you release it to our sector and whether people are clients of Bloomerang or not, it doesn't matter. You're putting this information out, which I think is incredibly valuable and um, kind of astonishing. So this is not a new thing for the ecosystem of your company, is it? No, and I mean, thank you for that shout out and thank you for uh, noticing that we, so many of us are former fundraisers first, mm -hmm. and that really shapes our passion for the sector. Myself, I've worked in higher education fundraising. So working for a company like Bloomerang that serves nonprofits is something I'm passionate about, almost second nature. And so the research we publish, the desire and the team behind it that's writing and researching really cares for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. It's a background most of us have, and that's yeah. what kind of fuels us to share this with the sector. Right. I think it's really powerful that you have been on that other side of the, mm -hmm. the ask desk, if you will, yes. and that you can then um, blend in your talents with uh, PR and communications, but have a real framework for what it takes to do fundraising. Um, and, and so that's even more impressive. Um, you know, it's fascinating. I did not know until we got started this morning that your background was with higher ed. Um, and wow, if there was ever a sector that deals with generational wealth and giving, oh yeah, holy moly, that's it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, so much is changing now, right? We kind of chatted earlier about our own families. I have a younger sister and she keeps me up to date with Gen Z memes and humor. And then of yeah. course we have older baby boomer parents that we're talking to, um, you know, going through cell phone issues and FaceTiming together. So within one's own family, we notice these generational differences or generational preferences. Yeah. And so when we get into the world of fundraising, there's even more nuance, right? With how we target um, our donors and how we meet them where they are. Right. Well, let's get into this and, and uh, let's have you tell us why gener generational giving trends matter, like why we need to be looking yeah. at these and also 
like maybe if you could give us some background on how and why Bloomerang even embarked upon this journey. Yeah. So why it's important. Generational giving trends are really important because we know that donor segmentation matters and that it has a positive impact, right? So if we are able to tailor our communications to a donor's interests, we are likely to have better fundraising outcomes. So that's first and foremost. Second, we know that we are on the verge of a large transfer of wealth right now. Yeah. An estimated 87 trillion is supposed to be transferred from members of the baby boomer generation to their younger counterparts over the next um, 30 years. So that's significant. Uh, we wanted to kind of explore what does that mean and how can nonprofits begin to nurture and engage donors or supporters of the next generation so that when this shift occurs, we're ready. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we did um, a first draft of this report, but that was in 2020. I think it launched in really early March, oh, right before the pandemic. <laughs> so of course. obviously a little, a little bit's changed since then. So that's why we decided to go back and do a second version of the report, re-poll different generations and um, kind of dive into the findings and disperse them. Right. It's such an important topic. I mean, I feel for um, in terms of where we are with our nonprofit sector, it's got to be like one of the top three issues. And I, I don't know about you, but I feel like we're not talking about this enough. Mm -hmm. um, that we think about, um, you know, super wealthy donors and the super uh, donor packs and actions, I should not packs, but donor activities and actions. And I think we kind of think, oh, that's where it's all happening. And we forget the wealth transference of very common people, right? Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's easy, right? And like saying this from experience, I've been there when you're, in the trenches fundraising, you want to focus and often face pressure to focus on the deal you're making right then and there. Right. Um, and it can be difficult to kind of get out of that pattern and begin to think about, okay, what's next and what is sustainable fundraising? How can I continue this momentum into the future? And that, that can be difficult. So I really do hope that this report um, can kind of help fundraisers see and nonprofit leaders see the importance of tuning into the next generation mm -hmm. and nurturing them as this transfer wealth happens. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, let's have you kind of back up a little bit and give us a snapshot of each generation. Like, sure. what should we be thinking about when we talk about this generational transference of wealth? Yeah, so there is two kind of like overarching themes or spectrums that run across all generations that we surveyed. We surveyed from Gen Z, so starting at age 18, up mm -hmm. to members of the baby boomer generation, so up to about age 78. And two big things we noticed that were really interesting. As donors age, they place more importance on organizational overhead costs. Younger generations, it matters less and less too, and it doesn't impact their decision to donate. Okay, that's like for me a hair and fire moment. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, great. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, really, really interesting. And it, I, yeah, I really like that finding. The next one, which I think people may expect, is that younger generations place more importance on technology and specifically digital platforms like social media. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned earlier, Gen Z, younger generation, places the least amount of importance on organ organizational overhead. When they're looking to make a donation, what they're looking for is an up-to-date social media presence and an up-to-date website for the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. This generation is also very active.
active. And I think they have a reputation for that of being very cause driven and social justice oriented. Yeah. We found that this generation volunteers very actively and actually outpaces millennials and baby boomers when it comes to volunteer activities. Mm-hmm. So they're definitely not a generation to gloss over. And I would really encourage fundraisers um, and nonprofit professionals to target this demographic. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that's a really good comment because I think what happens is we forget that that concept of POE, the point of entry, mm-hmm. that somebody comes in to an effort, an action, a campus, a drive, whatever, and there's an opportunity for a point of entry that is hard to beat right and so and that can last a lifetime i mean it might be something that draws somebody in might not be that year or that moment to the extent that you want but it comes back oh yeah um another interesting fact about this generation they enjoy in-person fundraising events more than any other generation i was not expecting that And so, you know, we may have, and I certainly discovered this about myself, I have my own assumptions, right, about what generations want or what their preferences are. And I had assumed a very digital generation like Gen Z may not be interested in in in-person events. Mm -hmm. That couldn't be further from the truth. So definitely encourage fundraisers and nonprofits, reach out to this generation, um, Mm -hmm. invite them to your events, begin nurturing them. and seeking their help when it comes to volunteering. Mm -hmm. Millennials as well, very digital savvy. Um, First place they'll go when choosing to make a donation is a nonprofit's website. They are also very interested in recurring giving. And so something we've talked about internally is to view this generation as your subscription generation, right? Netflix, HelloFresh, whatever it may be, yeah. even clothing services, right? Yeah. This generation is really into that. So I would encourage organizations, make sure you have a way to accept recurring gifts mm-hmm. or get members of this generation into giving plans. Just make sure that's really accessible. Mm-hmm. Love that. You know, that's not an apparent thing that I would have like assumed, as you mentioned, you start off, we all have our own assumptions. Um, But yet when I step back and I'm thinking about my life and my own consumer behavior, yeah. Yeah. It's a subscription service. Yeah. It's easy. And it's affordable too. We saw, you know, after the pandemic and the years following an increase in monthly giving and people framing it in a way of, okay, you can't afford this bigger donation right now. Well, consider splitting it up. And that can be so effective at getting folks in just the habit of giving. Yeah. Really interesting. I love this. See, I told it, I told you everybody, this is (laughs) going to be amazing. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. I mean, Gen X, we call these, this is the yearbook generation. Mm -hmm. And by that, what I mean is they win every superlative basically most likely to volunteer, um, most likely to donate with a digital wallet, outpacing uh, Gen Z, or after Gen Z, I should say. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're also the generation that is most likely to serve on a board or committee. Mm -hmm. So this generation really is a powerhouse. They, you know, are a little bit later on in their careers, more established, they're great to begin nurturing for leadership or involvement opportunities. Mm-hmm. And um, talking about things we find are interesting, they're very interested in digital wallets. So different tap to pay services, Venmo, PayPal, you name it. So having those options and ways to donate is really important to um, give this generation an easy way to give. Right. Baby boomers, this generation, as I mentioned earlier, values transparency and disclosure around organizational overhead the most. Mm -hmm. So for this generation, we really just advocate that nonprofits are very transparent 
make sure your annual report is easy to find on your yeah. website. And if you're having conversations about organizational overhead, just be very transparent and highlight the value of your staff and the various programs that overhead contributes to. Right. Um, I think, you know, along those lines, it's the economic impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we forget, you know, 1.8 million nonprofits registered in this country. They're paying taxes. They're paying and, and mm -hmm. a lot of taxes from sales taxes to, you know, uh, labor issue, real estate taxes. You know, they're they're buying office supplies. They're leasing space. They're leasing office equipment. Right. There's a powerhouse here of an economic engine that I think a lot of times we forget. And so I think yeah. this, th that's kind of the context um, with which that makes a difference. And we, we, we forget about it, right? Um, this is just a, a riveting conversation to me. And wow, I am so excited that you would talk to us about this. You use this phrase, this, this, this word, omni-generation. I've never heard this. Talk to us about what that means and how we can derive some takeaways. Yeah. So as much as we wanted to dive into the nuance, right? What does each individual generation prefer or seek out? There were some overarching themes yeah. that despite age applied to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really fascinating to see. Um, and there's three that I brought to the table to kind of discuss and bring up today. First, the overarching way that donors learn about an organization that they will eventually donate to is through their social circle, their peers mm -hmm. and word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's incredibly important and you just can't emphasize enough. Your mm -hmm. employees, friends, family members, the people that give to an organization and are already invested are the best advocates to get the word out and to encourage more people to give to your organization. So mm -hmm. that's a big one. Um, digital giving methods are really important. So uh, let me see here. What we found is it isn't just a strict divide between, okay, maybe older generations just want to give via check. Right. What we found is that giving via credit card and debit card yeah. or digital wallet is still very important to members of these generations. Right. So I would not discredit digital wallets. Um, if you're a nonprofit listening, I would look into adopting those and even putting a QR code on your direct mail. So when you're reaching out to maybe older generations of donors or supporters, mm -hmm. if they want to do something simple like tap to pay, they can. They scan yeah. a QR code. It's really easy. Um, communication. That's the next big thing. Uh, all donors want to hear from the nonprofits they support, whether they're supporting financially or giving their time on a monthly basis. And this communication does not involve fundraising asks. Right. We Thank were, you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we were specifically trying to measure just conversation, yeah. not a fask, not an ask, just yeah. updates on your programs, what you're offering, how the staff at your organization are doing and how those you serve are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know why in our sector um, this is such a hard concept to understand. Mm -hmm. But just that, you know, I, I always think of the boy method because of you, because of you, we have fed this many people or we did this or we did that. It's that I think is what donor investors want. Right. Yeah. You know, they, they want to know their impact. Yeah. yeah. It's such an important thing. And I love that this kind of transcends our, our uh, generational demographics. Yeah. And the preferred channel was through email for every generation. Okay. So I would definitely encourage nonprofits if they don't have one set up yet, now is the time to set up an email newsletter. 
Mm -hmm. begin to facilitate a monthly habit of getting communications out to your donors and your supporters that don't include fundraising asks. Mm -hmm. This is really critical to not only retain donors, but also to nurture new supporters or those who have, you know, heard about your organization so that someday they will be ready to become a donor. Right, right. And, you know, I, I think that's, um, again, I, I said this in the very beginning, um, page 40 of your report, you have this fabulous yes. graphic and it's this trajectory in one place um, that would dispel any thoughts about what you think or, or what you're afraid of when it comes to that stewarding, that, that mm -hmm. donor and that journey. It's brilliant. But it, a big part of that is this communication aspect. Um, you know, not just asking or, or what did you use the great word? Fast. 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 Yeah. Thank you for the ask. You know, that kind of a thing. Um, I think it's just also, it's, it's good business, right? Yeah. It's good business. We want to know where, where our organizations are going. We want to know what they're doing and we want to be able to align our personal missions with those nonprofit missions, right? Exactly. Rela relationship maintenance and just keeping a good relationship, right? Yeah. People want to be in a relationship with organizations or people that don't always ask them for things. And I'm not yeah. saying you shouldn't ask. You should certainly continue your fundraising appeals, but nurture your donors. Talk to them about their impact. That's really important. Right, right. I love this. Well, you know, again, I could talk to you like all day and all week and all month. <laughs> we have a, a limited amount of time. I want to wrap up with like these kind of surprising messages and things mm. that we need to be watching. Because one of the things about demographic um, evaluation and study and thought leadership is it's not a one and done thing. It's changing. Yeah. It's, it's an evolution what are some of these things that we should be looking at? Yeah. Um, something that I did not mention at the very beginning when you asked why this is important is sector data and performance. So I'm sure on the show you have talked about the fundraising effectiveness project and the, later, the latest performance of the sector as a whole. We know that since 2020, donor numbers and retention rates have dipped. Yeah. So it's just really important to, like I said earlier, nurture our donors and thank our donors so that we can retain them and have an increasing donor pool for years to come. This is what can make fundraising sustainable. What we found, which I find surprising, is that donors have really low expectations when it comes to being thanked, which is rather unfortunate. Wow. We found that 60% of all donors do not expect to receive a personalized thank you after making a donation. Yeah. <laughs> what? Back up 60%? Yeah. And I, yes, oh. jaw on the floor for sure. Yeah. But, you know, that kind of like that to me is is uh, um, it condemns our entire sector because it almost seems like they've experienced this because they've, mm -hmm. they they formed this opinion because they've experienced it. Right. They've been making donations, but nothing has happened. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Well, I interrupted. Go ahead, because I'm fascinated by this. No, you're good. I think what this really says and what this is a good way to view it is this is an opportunity. Right. We have an opportunity to exceed our donors' expectations in the yeah. best way and help them realize how important their generosity and their impact is on our missions. And so that's how I would encourage our listeners to view this. Mm -hmm. I think we can start simple, certainly use AI to help you write thank yous and then personalize them. Um, it's very, very important. We have a big opportunity here to exceed our donor expectations right. and hopefully help them feel appreciated so that they continue to give year after year and we can boost our donor retention rates. Right. 
Well, and not to keep harping on this like page 40 graphic, which, you know, I keep harping on, but I think that this is why we need that journey mm -hmm. spelled out, right? So that yeah. it, it becomes pro forma, that we know what what is to be done, no matter who it is on the team or if someone comes or leaves or whatever, but this is the standard with which, you know, we behave with our donors. Yeah. Exactly. There's there's definitely a journey there. And I would encourage folks, like, if you have a great donor CRM, you can begin to map out that journey. So many days from first gift, a thank you call. And this is more than just the tax acknowledgement receipt, right? Yes. Um, thank you call, a mailer, get them on your monthly newsletter, different communication touch points that can just reiterate their impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, sometimes we think that it has to be something really shiny and fabulous mm -hmm. and really over the top. Um, but I think it's these like small, consistent, and I'll yes. use that word again, consistent approaches so that our teams know what to do. And yeah. then our donors can begin to understand, you know, how effective we can be. Because I don't know about you, but I feel like this speaks volumes as to when you have a, a, a successful donor journey, mm -hmm. um, I think you can translate that into how an organization serves their clients, how they serve their community, how they work with stakeholders. I think it leaches in and across our overall behavior. And I think it builds credibility or slashes it right? right if we're not doing those things how that becomes actually you know negative yeah no you're absolutely right um the next point i want to bring up or surprising finding i should say is that generations or all donors are prioritizing an organization's digital presence this was something i expected to see among younger generations mm -hmm. but all generations, one of the first places they will go to research an organization before making a donation is the nonprofit's website, followed by their social media profiles. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to not discount your website or your social media handles for older generations. They do matter and having updated content can help you be perceived as more effective, um, and just showcase the work that you're doing on a regular basis. Yeah, I, I love that. I think that's a great way to end our time with you because at the, at the end of the day, um, you can do a lot of things, but if you don't have those basic tools in place, um, it's a, it's a slog. It's really a, a missed opportunity. Wow. I have so enjoyed this. I think it's been really interesting. And again, I think the, the value for me, um, Milena, is that this is something that you all have spent a lot of time and money and leadership on, and you are opening this up to our sector. It's, it is incredible, incredible work. Um, and I think this is, you know, one of those things, uh, go on bloomerang.com. You can learn about it. And I think you should download it and send it to your board members and your C-suite because it is a really great for me planning tool. You know, I think this this is information that can go into an organization's strategic plan. I really, really believe it. It's um, it, the 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 organizations that look at this in that capacity are going to be leaps and bounds ahead of other organizations. It's valuable information. Really cool. Thank you, Julia. Really appreciate that. I really yeah. do. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, as senior manager of PR and communications at Bloomerang, you have a lot of work, my friend, that you do. <laughs> I, I think it's really cool to see you all work and how you do things and, and how you wrestle with like big concepts and big things going on in our sector. And we are really, really grateful, not just here on the nonprofit show, because uh, you've been with us from basically day one, almost 1200 mm -hmm. episodes ago. Uh, you've really been a big part of, of how we reach the community. But uh, 
just with great thought leadership. So it's wonderful to be able to see you all succeed with that. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, you know, we have, as I mentioned, the amazing partnership with, with uh, Bloomerang, but we also have partnerships with the American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and Fundraisers Friday, our new show on Fridays, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that join us day in and day out so we can have these great conversations that really lift and help guide even our nonprofit sector. Um, you know, as we end each and every episode, we have this mantra, and I always say this, it sounds hokey, but it means different things to me each day, depending on who our guest has been. And today I'm thinking about the future and how we look forward. And the message is this, to stay well so you can do well. Thank you so much, everyone.